everyone. Uh, so I'm Dulancha Lianage. I'm a technical lead at WSO2 and uh, working with the platform security team at WSO2. Previously, I worked with the WSO2 identity server uh, product. So today, uh, today's session uh, is about the security architectures or patterns that can be used to uh, increase the security of your organization. But before going into more details on that, I would like to quickly share with you uh, some points from a recent survey that was conducted by the UK government with the help from security analyst firms. Okay, so this is the 2015 Information Security Breach Survey of uh, United Kingdom. So 90% of large organizations and 74% of small businesses. That means nine out of 10 organizations in UK had a security breach in 2015. And that's an 81% and 60% respective increase from the year before that. The cost of the breaches, for a large one, it would be uh, up to 3.14 million pounds. And for a smaller one, it would be uh, 311,000 pounds. Now, interestingly, 28% of the worst security breaches were caused partly by, surprise, senior management not giving enough priority to this organization's security. And 50% of the breaches were uh, caused by human error. And 75% of large organizations and 31% of small businesses suffered staff-related security breaches. That means internal breaches. 75% of big organizations suffered. This is quite scary, right? These are valid data. So if, we are, if you are not uh, prioritizing or investing in security in your organization, things will get worse. So it's not only about cost. Right? More than that, it would end up in bad reputation for your organization. So within this session, what we are going to look into is what is the problem we have, and then what are the solutions that uh, can be given. The main problem is security is a non-functional requirement. Right? So, no one is coming and telling, uh, OK, uh, I want to limit this much of users, like throttling policies, or I want to encrypt in this mechanism, et cetera. They simply want, I want user and password, uh, user to log into the system, right? Not how it might be stored. That's the usual case. So even in quality assurance and developers, they mostly consider about the functional and use experience aspects, not security. So security is considered as the last, uh, last requirement, and it's the first one to go out of the window when project gets delayed or there are tight deadlines. That's the two. Okay. Then the next problem is knowledge on security's list. This is true uh, from the senior management to architects to developers. So it's quite easy to introduce security holes into the products, into the network architecture. Right? So they are not, uh, uh, not uh, knowledgeable about the latest vulnerabilities or how an attacker would think, how an hacker would think about your organization's infrastructure. Right? So having the defender's, uh, defender's mindset will not help. Right? You'll need to have an attacker's mindset. Right? And also, uh, many doesn't understand, uh, many don't understand the criticality of security until something bad happens. And when the bad thing happens, it would be a chaos when we uh, talk about security. It's not like other business functions, right? And often people feel secure through obscurity. So there can be a feature or there can be a code segment in your product that has some security vulnerabilities. The developer might know it's there, but that feature might not be used by others in, in the outside. So what developer thinks is it's not used. So no one is going to hack it because no one knows that there is such a feature in the uh, system. So it's like uh, you lock your home and you keep your uh, key under the welcome mat. No one sees it, right? 
But the thief who knows where to find what, he can find that. Same thing with security. Then another problem is too much of security will reduce usability. So it is uh, utmost important that uh, you find the right balance between security and the usability of your system. So let's take this image for an example. If that laptop uh, is padlocked like that with a chain, no one can use it, right? So there's no use of having a laptop in the first place, right? So if there are some data uh, without much sensitivity, and you have this uh, uh, retina scanning, fingerprint scanning, and all sort of security mechanisms, no one is going to like to use that. Right? So it all depends on the sensitivity of your data, what sensitivity of what you are trying to protect. So it is uh, important that you find the right balance be between those two. Right? So failing to do that is another problem for those uh, numbers that we saw in the previous slide. So security patterns can re uh, help to reduce this risk. So people have gone through these problems, right? They have found uh, standards, they have come up with protocols, how to do things, right? So these established protocols, having an understanding on them can help you to enforce, uh, reinforce your security uh, in the organization. Okay? So within this session, we are going to look into these key attributes of security. That's authentication, authorization, confidentiality, Integrity, non-repudiation, auditing, availability. So if, you, uh, if your developers put enough effort on all these areas, then uh, you can increase uh, the security of your uh, architecture. So let's go one by one. Okay. So what's authentication? It's quite simple, right? Verifying that the user is who he or she claims to be. That's basically, I am proving myself to a system, to your system, right? So if you can't prove that, you can't pass. You're stopped from there. Simple, right? So that's authentication. In authentication, uh, we have uh, two flavors. One is direct authentication. The other one is brokered authentication. Someone can call it as delegated authentication. So in direct, we have uh, basically direct authentication means there's a user and a service provider. That's your application or, or whatever, uh, uh, providing a service to the user. There's a direct communication between these two. You directly, user directly authenticates to the system. So system maintains maybe a user profile. It handles user's credentials and grant access if a user gets authenticated. And this user can be an end user, a human, or a system user, an application again, right? So we have uh, uh, these authentication mechanisms for direct authentication. Basic authentication, that's basically user and password, then digest auth, which is a, a getting a hash of the password with some other attributes, right? Uh, and TLS mutual authentication based on uh, uh, certificates and then OAuth client credentials. Right. So for direct authentication pattern, you can consider these uh, technologies or these standards that are uh, available. Then coming to brokered authentication, now the image has changed a bit. There's another party, identity provider. So user's identity is maintained at a single location, ID provider, and that uh, there are multiple service provider trusting that single line provider. Right? So what does it uh, bring to the table? So it's less work for service providers and more security for the identity. It's a win-win solution. Right? Previously, uh, in most scenarios, service provider has to keep the user's identity. So he has to be concerned about the security about the privacy issues, and so many other things, rather than concentrating on the business logic. Right? Now what we are doing is, we are decoupling that. We are giving that responsibility to the identity provider, which is acting as a broker. Right? Now service provider doesn't have to think that much on uh, protecting the identity and doing uh, authentication. Right? So some examples are SAML, OAuth, 
Uh, in OAuth, uh, there are two grant types we call it as, SAML2 and JWT and OpenID. So how this trust is built uh, depends on the protocol. It can be pre-configured trust, like in SAML case. You go and configure trust before the communication happens. In OpenID uh, case, it's on-the-fly trust. Right? So basically, the identity provider vouchers for that user. Right? So I trust that user. So service provider, you go ahead and you also trust that user because I am your INT provider, right? So that is brokered authentication. That's a broker who's the INT provider. From brokered authentication, uh, as a byproduct, we get single sign-on. Since multiple service providers now trust a single IDP, if a user has a session created with that IDP uh, in the same browser, then when he tries to access other service providers, they automatically get logged in. Right? So that's another pattern. So we discussed about uh, direct authentication pattern, then the brokered authentication. Now in either of these, you can use multi-factor authentication. Right? So what is multi-factor authentication and why it is needed? So if you are using a username and password, that is something you know about. Right? That we call as a single factor, something you know. Then another factor is something you have. It can be your mobile phone to which an OTP comes. It can be X509 certificate. It can be a token generator like that in the picture. Right? And then finally, something you are. Basically, your biometric attributes like your uh, uh, fingerprint, your eye, your retina scanning, etc. So depending on the sensitivity of the data, as I mentioned before, you have to decide which factor to go ahead with. So if there are not much sensitivity, then there's no use you are using multi-factor authentication because you are reducing the usability of the system. Right? So it depends on the context. So you have to take that decision depending on the context. So then we have an INT federation pattern um, here, uh, in previous scenarios, what we discussed was about a single ID provider in your domain, right? So let's take it as the ID provider in this uh, foo domain. Right? Now, uh, you have a single sign-on solution in that domain where you can see that user is accessing the web app in the same domain. Now, if the user wants to go across the border to a different domain, right? So he's trying to access an app in the Domain bar. So domain bar app doesn't trust the INT server in domain foo. He has no idea about domain foo, right? So he only, uh, it only trusts the IDP in domain bar. So when a user tries to access the application, application will redirect the user from brokering to domain bar's IDP. At that point, the user tells, I am from domain foo, not from bar because that uh, bar IDP doesn't have any clue about who this user is, because it is, that user is not in uh, uh, that IDP's user store. Right? So bar IDP will redirect the user to the foo, and user will authenticate that foo IDP, and get redirected back to the service provider through the bar IDP. So that's the federation pattern. So in that communication, you can see uh, uh, there's a token exchange happening. The token generated from the foo IDP is given to the bar IDP, then bar IDP generates a new token to the service provider. So there's a token exchange happening there. So this uh, 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 builds a, to a concept called identity bus. So WSO2 INT server can act, act as an enterprise identity bus. Right? So you have heard of enterprise service bus. It's a similar concept. In this case, what INT service transforming is identity protocols, tokens, and user claims from one IDP to another. So the request can come in any of these protocols. INT service capable to convert that to a different protocol and send a request to uh, uh, to an outside INT provider. Okay. 
Okay, so coming to another pattern that you can use in your organization is the trusted subsystem pattern. The nodes or uh, network elements inside your internal network can be uh, 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 treated as in a trusted, within a trusted boundary. Right? So there's only a single entry point to the trust boundary from outside. So uh, this client authenticates to this service, which is the entry point, which can be an API gateway, uh, uh, something like that, using its client credentials. But after that step, that client credentials are no longer used because it's not needed. Right? Communication within the trust boundary happens through trusted subsystem credentials. So it can be X509 certificates. Right? So this uh, entry point will extract users' attributes or whatever needed for further processing within the system and then send those to uh, the other systems using uh, certificates or some other uh, trust uh, subsystem mechanism. Right? Okay. Then in authentication, another uh, uh, interesting concept is this multiple user stores. So in your organization, there can be employees, right? then partners, then uh, customers using uh, same applications. Right? Usually, all of these user identities not stored in a single user store. Right? So it's always better to separate out the concerns. Employees in one user store, partners in another, and uh, uh, customers in, in a different user store. So it increases the security uh, and maintainability of your system. So ws 2 INT server is capable to uh, connect to multiple such user stores and authenticate a user. So if a user comes to the website and puts the credentials, IT server can f iterate through the user stores and find out that user and authenticate him or her uh, for that. All right. So we are coming to the next concept. That's authorization. So basically, OK, you are authenticated, but you can't do that. Right. Not everything can be done. Uh, even though you are authenticated. So it's basically verifying what an authenticator user can do. So d this depends on user's entitlements or permissions or privileges. Right? So it's based on a principle called uh, principle of least privilege. So a set of entitlements or a, privilege, a, a minimum set of entitlements would be given to a user to get something done, nothing more. And then for authorizations, uh, we mainly have two mechanisms. One is role-based access control. Basically, there's a set of, uh, a subset of privileges associated with the role, which is given to a user or group of users. Then we have attribute-based access control. So this is uh, somewhat going uh, fine-grained. The previous one is coarse-grained, we call it as. In attribute-based access control, it can be the attribute of any attribute of user, age, country, address, mobile phone, whatever, doing authorization based on that. So in attribute-based access control, we get this concept as a concept of policy-based access control. Right? So it is not easy to do attribute-based access control in your code, maintain all these attributes, mapping them. It is quite a cumbersome task. That's where policies comes into picture. Which is, uh, uh, which is easy to maintain and uh, do governance on those policies. Right? So when talking about policy-based access control, uh, the de facto standard we have is SACML, Extensible Access Control Markup Language. So in here, SACML introduces uh, multiple uh, 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 points uh, called as P star P. Like there's a, a PEP, which is the policy enforcement point, which is inside your app. That's the one who wants to get the user authorized. Then there's a policy decision point, which will get the request from PEP and compare, uh, validate that with a set of policies it has and tell deny or permit. Right? And then there's a PAP, policy administration point, where the policy admins would be creating policies, maintaining policies, and doing all the governance stuff. Okay. So there's another interesting concept called delegated authorization. Uh, so, so far we have discussed direct 
uh, something uh, similar to direct authorization, where uh, a, a user is authorized directly uh, to consume a service provider. But in delegated authorization, a user is not consuming the service provider, rather than that, another application is consuming the service provider. But user is delegating the authorization, he saw her authorization to that app to act on behalf of him or her. Right? So the standard for that is OAuth. So which brings into the table these four concepts, a client, the owner of the resource, the server that does the authorization, and the server where the resources are located. Right? OK. So we discussed about the authentication and authorization. Now coming to confidentiality. Confidentiality is maintained by encryption. So we have uh, these mechanisms. Uh, you can use these mechanisms to maintain in, uh, confidentiality in your organization. So they are, uh, can be done, this, this can be done at transport level or message level. And then we have a symmetric encryption. That means using the same key on both sides doing the encryption. Then a symmetric encryption, uh, which goes to this PKI, a public key infrastructure using a private key and a public key. And session key-based encryption, which means uh, unique keys will be generated for each message within an established session. Right? So after symmetric encryption is done, you can have a, a symmetric key to do the communication after that, because asymmetric encryption is quite uh, 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 it's performance heavy. Okay. Then integrity, that means uh, uh, to make sure the data was not messed up during the transmission. Right. How to do that? That is done by digital signatures. Digital, uh, digital signature is basically hashing your message and then encrypting it with the private key of the sender. So whoever has the public key of that, uh, 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 whoever receiving the message, who has the public key of that uh, uh, sender can verify and make sure that integrity is protected. So first, verify the signature, then get the hash, rehash whatever received, compare the hashes, and you know the integrity is not uh, compromised. Then non-repudiation is also provided by digital signatures. So basically, it's, uh, you can't deny something once you sent it out. Right? So that is, again, done by a uh, private public key, signing uh, using the private key. And uh, private key can be owned by only one person. So if that signature can be verified from a public key, that means whoever sent that is the one who owns the private key. You can't deny that. Then coming to auditing, so uh, in the very first uh, uh, slide where I show you the stats, 50% uh, of the threats were caused by human error, right? So whatever measures you take, right, people might still make mistakes. And that's a 50% chance of that, right? So there can be a nice Trojan horse. You have this very strong castle, but still some people, uh, one person might see that's a very nice horse. So bring him in. Right? And it compromises your security. So you need to have uh, audit logs and uh, periodically analyze those logs for any anomaly in the system. Right? Because people do mistakes. Right? Then finally, availability. So you need to take network level measures, like to uh, stop denial of service attacks. So you can measure whether uh, a request is coming from the same source uh, like a bombarding system, right? You detect that and you stop that uh, communication. And then throttling, it can be based on a client ID or, or a user name. He's a valid user, but still he's bombarding system, so you need to stop him. Right? And other measures, uh, especially, you need to opt for these fail fast techniques. Failing is natural. You fail, but you need to fail fast and get up soon, right? So that's the key thing to uh, keep in mind. So to do that, uh, these uh, watchdog uh, uh, systems where it does a heartbeat and uh, hot pooling mechanisms 
can be used. So in hot pooling, there are multiple instances taking an input from a common in a queue. So even though one goes down, there's another one waiting to grab that and process it. And the watchdog will start up that uh, uh, stopped node. Yeah. So apart from those uh, uh, seven attributes, uh, I would like to uh, discuss a bit more on secure deployment patterns. So here we can see uh, three zones. Uh, I'm pretty sure you are already aware of this. We have a red zone that is the internet, which is the unsecured area. Then we have a, a DMC, demilitarized zone, uh, where your API gateway or integration points exist. That's the entry point to your internal network, right? And then finally you have the internal network green zone. So the apps in the red zone can't directly access the green zone, right? Because it needs to go through the firewalls and firewall only allows, only, has only opened the ports between the DMC, uh, the API gateway and the services. So no one else can't come through, right? So you need to, uh, like your network, you need to create these zones to make sure the sensitive data are protected. So whatever most sensitive, you need to put at the very end, where no one can access. Then finally, a uh, more restricted view on this pattern. In here, you can see that communication going up and down between the yellow zone and green zone. But we can restrict communication coming from yellow to green by having a message broker in between. So request will be put into message broker from yellow zone, and green zone will pull that, process it, and then put back. And uh, yellow zone can pick it up and uh, do the rest. Right? OK. So that was a quick go through on these uh, protocols and practices that you can adhere to. So my, uh, uh, my, what I want to convey is that security is of utmost priority. So don't keep it at the very end. Integrate it at the very beginning to your software development lifecycle. So it will increase your uh, security at the end, and then uh, you won't have to throw it out when deadlines come and things get uh, tighter. Right? Thank you very much.